And so I don't remember that much from that night besides him carrying me and to my room and saying just, you know, God bless you and, and, and I hope you survive the night. Ladies and gentlemen, we are back with the best in series. It all started uh, last year with uh, Best in Armenia, the Bahamas, Aruba, Trinidad and Tobago, Brazil and Austria. And now, uh, besides Austria, we're going into a colder area, which is going to be, to be the best in Iceland with Jorvar Gretason. Welcome to the show, Jorvar. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you for being here. Uh, just to be clear, Hjör, is it Hjörvar Gretason? Do I say, say it correctly? Or? Yeah, it's actually it's actually quite a good pronunciation. It's Hjörvar Gretason. Oh wow! Okay, that yeah, it's, that it's is tough, challenging. Tough. <laughs> Probably just use the the last name. It's easier. Okay, no, no, I, I'll try with I'll, I'll try with Hjörvar. <laughs> it, it's it's yeah, going to be it's going to be fine. Um, so, Iceland. You are the best chess player in Iceland uh, at the moment, momentarily, and I mm -hmm. suppose you're trying to stay uh, the best for a longer while. Um, I am. I'm curious because uh, Iceland, okay, it is kind of a large country area-wise, but the population mm -hmm. is not that big. But after all, there's a lot of good chess players in Iceland. Um, and, and actually, there's a lot of them also called Gretarsson with the last name. Is there any, uh, do you have any relation to them or is it related or of any kind? Uh, well, I don't think I'm related to any of the, or any of my colleagues, but I haven't really checked. But it's, it's funny that you mention it because we have this website in Iceland where we can check how we are related. And I mean, I should probably not be saying this, but we usually use it to avoid, you know, incest situation so i mean you don't want to marry your cousin so but i should definitely check but i i'm not related to the other gretison that is my colleague and mm. uh, but i think it just uh, shows that you know men from iceland that have the name greta are you know convenient at breeding good chess players so but i don't th <laughs> i don't think we are related uh no I got gotcha. you. Yeah, I, I heard about this app um, and it's actually, <laughs> although it sounds a bit uh, strange for some people, it actually is, it makes a lot of sense. And of course, it is uh, f fits its purpose after all. Um, let's start at the very beginning. So do you remember uh, how you learned to play chess? Um, yes, I do. I, I was around five or six. There was a lot of, you know, interest in chess in my school. And my brother was also playing at that time. So I just, I started playing and it kind of suited me uh, from the beginning. And I think that, I mean, we sometimes forget all the opportunities that we get through chess. And uh, before this interview, I was, I was uh, remembering one, one moment in particular when my friend came to me or friends uh, at the tender age of 13, I think. And they were telling me that they were going to Denmark to put on a soccer trip. And I just couldn't understand the enthusiasm and the excitement of going to Denmark to play, you know, soccer, because at that point I traveled across Europe to play chess. And I mean, no offense, but they don't even have mountains. So I, I couldn't really understand why, what the excitement was about. So that was the first point I, I really, you know, appreciated all that chess had given me at that point. Mm. So I, I think it just, you know, onward and upwards from there. To be honest. Mm -hmm. Interesting, yeah. Um, so you said just uh, you learned chess in school already. So that is mm -hmm. also something which was like I'm wondering uh, a lot of times, and this is a question I wanted to to ask you since a long time because we 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 already contacted each other a, a longer time mm -hmm. ago trying to gather all the people who are the best in their country. Um, do you think that? Bobby Fischer or the World Championship from 1972 has had an effect on Iceland during, because of the chess boom or was it even a big thing even before? I think it definitely played a part. I mean, it would be ignorant to say that the World Championship match, the most famous match of all time, didn't have an effect on the, on the chess population in Iceland. But I think it's, it's various factors, to be honest. I mean... And we had a great role model in Frederik Olofsson, uh, the former FIDE president. 
I mean, just he was sort of like Fisher if you compare them. He was like a young, I mean, young, intelligent, really handsome guy, and, <laughs> and I mean, the the younger boys were probably probably aspiring to become like them. And but I also think that um, the comparative wealth that was in Iceland, you know, four or five decades ago, compared to other countries also played a part. Hmm. I mean, if you look at the chess scene now in the world, you have, you know, India, China, Iran, you know, all of these countries that are, you know, having all these strong players hmm. that they didn't have, you know, all these decades ago. So we had this advantage that we were able to travel and, and you know, learn the game of chess. Hmm. So I think, it, I think there are various factors, but hmm. this is also a problem in Iceland these days that, I mean, if you want to become a chess professional, like I'm trying to be, <laughs> trying to be, I mean, you, you're also sacrificing a really kind of comfortable life, you know, in an average job in Iceland with a salary a lot higher than, than you know, a chess player would ever have. Mm. So, I mean, if you're in a situation where it's a must, like I think, you know, some players from India where they don't see, you know, a way out instead of, you know, becoming a chess player, it's really hard to to be competitive and and you know you know fight for the spot. So mm. I think there are various factors, but you're also feeling you know the negative sides of it. Mm, I can imagine. Uh, I reckon, like uh, I mean, you're a grandmaster. You have a two thousand six hundred uh, rating at the moment. Um, I thought that uh, I mean you are a chess professional this is your profession or do you have any other side jobs because it's just too difficult in Iceland um, I well from <laughs> a young age I mean my parents always supported me as a chess player that was not the problem but they also said that I should have a backup plan mm -hmm. because if you lose interest in chess at some point Let's say that happens when when I was 15, I was not listening to them because I thought that chess was going to be my life forever. But they, they told me, like, you know, just get education and then just see where it goes. And I'm really grateful that I did that because I'm currently working in a bank as well. Uh, it's like an eight to four four job that mm -hmm. I really like because I I am a social person. I'm an extrovert, not an introvert, like many of you know my colleagues and. And just to be able to show up for work and, you know, uh, interact with people is really important. And you don't really get that a lot in chess. I mean, you get that at tournaments, but the negative side of it is, it is waking up and analyzing for eight to 10 hours a day, you know, by yourself in front of the computer. And, mm -hmm. and that can be really psychologically hard. Mm -hmm. So I chose to educate myself and, and, you know, have a stable job, but If somebody would ask me, how do you identify yourself? I would definitely say, you know, a chess player. Yes, yeah. that is what I love doing. So this is this is more of, you know, being rational than, than something else. So, yeah. You reached uh, the highest rating ever this year. Is this correct? Yeah. So 20, yeah. Yeah, as, as, a search, as, as a social person, which you mentioned just now, like being more of an extrovert, Uh, mm -hmm. Corona must have hit you even harder, uh, especially w when you're not allowed to go out that much. And uh, still you managed to get uh, the highest rating ever. How did that happen? I just, I think there are various factors uh, that came to play at that point. I think, I, I mean, I was doing, uh, I was doing well in my work, in my education. I'm finishing my second master's degree now in, uh, around Christmas. Oh, wow. And And I just, everything came to place somehow. And when you feel happy, you play better chess. It's, it's unbelievably, you know, it's unbelievable how much effect that has. Mm -hmm. You know, you just, when you sit down at the board and you look at your opponent and, and you feel confident, you just somehow play better. It's, uh, so I, I just think that everything came to place this year. For I'm sure. very glad to hear that because, yeah, there's a lot of people who, yeah can not say that so it's really really good to hear that that it even has that effect on you because i i mean sorry just to add sure I mean, we have been very fortunate here in iceland i mean we have had uh, you know we've never really had that strict measures we've never had a lockdown mm -hmm. and of course i mean we have three people per square kilometer here <laughs> so i mean we're not lacking in space so i mean It's not really a problem for us. So if you, uh, it, I think Corona has been 
quite gentle when it comes to the Icelandic population. Yeah. Uh, at least until now. So. Okay. Yeah. Fingers crossed it'll stay like that. Um, now, during your career, you have won a number of prestigious uh, titles. Um, for example, just this year, the Icelandic Championship. Um, is there a title that is particularly important for you? Um, good question. Uh, I would probably say the Icelandic Championship. And there is one specific reason for that. Uh, I have been a favorite in that tournament for uh, a long time or among the favorites for probably 10 years or something. But I never, I was never able to, you know, win that tournament. And for a competitive human being like myself, it was really frustrating. And, and it somehow became, you know, like uh, there was something, you know, haunting me. And I just, every time I entered the tournament, I was so focused on, you know, doing my best. And when it doesn't work out, when you put that much effort in, it's, it can really hurt when you, I mean, when you don't manage to win. So this year, I mean, uh, I just, there was something different, like I mentioned in the yeah. earlier question, that I just felt I entered the tournament like I couldn't lose. Uh, it was just, there was some, you know, mentality that wasn't there before. So I felt really confident when entering the tournament. So, and it also just meant a lot because, I mean, my family that have been supporting me since, you know, I started playing chess, they were, I think they were more relieved. Mm. You know, my, my grandparents at the age of 80, I think I'm, I mean, my grandmother almost cried. So uh, it just, it meant, uh, it meant a lot, not only for me, but also my, you know, supporting network. Wow. Sure. Wow. Yeah, that is uh, congratulations <laughs> for for that. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> I didn't know about it that you were, uh, I, yeah, that you were struggling for such a long time. Yeah, it must mm -hmm. have been amazing relief. I've been checking uh, the mega database and uh, discovered that most of your played openings are Queen Scamby, anti Nimzo Indian as white, mm -hmm. and as black, uh, the classical Sicilian defense. First of all, is this correct? And are these your favorite openings or are you just having the best scores with those openings? Yeah, well, I should probably not be saying anything in case my opponents <laughs> are watching, but uh, you're fairly accurate in your assessment. Uh, I think that, you know, when I started playing chess, I moved towards, you know, more of like English opening and then Queen's Gambit. Uh, quite early, which I think was a mistake. I think, you know, young players should definitely try to play open games, like mm -hmm. after E4, definitely. They should wait and, and maybe, you know, later on move to, you know, more solid openings. Um, but I think that, well, it's kind of funny to mention it, that the reason why I play the Sicilian is that my my coach and my mentor, Helge Olsson, was always recommending that I should play the Karo Khan. But I, I, I felt it was... It was way too slow and way too solid. So it was more like my anger towards the Karakan motivated me to push the pawn a little bit further. So, but I mean, I've always had a better score with black. My, it, I mean, even my mom barely knows how to play, knows how to play chess. She mentioned it that I somehow play more relaxed when I'm with black and not as, you know, not as eager to win. And it, these positions seem to suit me better, just solid openings man and maneuvering. So, yeah, you're definitely fairly accurate in your assessment that these are my favorite openings. <laughs> but I, I definitely like to play, you know, many openings in case my opponents are watching. I like to play everything, you know, just they should hear it from me. <laughs> yeah, sure, of course. <laughs> uh, coming back to when you started chess, uh, do you remember what was your very first big success where you felt like, okay, that's that's going on the right track and how did it feel okay my first first big win uh, to be honest I uh, when I was you know six to probably nine years old I didn't really feel that talented I, I mean I was maybe around third or fourth strongest in in Iceland and I somehow you know didn't feel like I was among the best to be honest uh, and I played the Nordic Championship under 10 in Faroe Islands. Uh, what was it 2001, I think, or two? And I ended up in 11th place out of 12 contestants. Um, 
And I remember just how hard that hit me, just like, wow, can I actually be that bad? Uh, so I worked really hard that year. I was really motivated. I, I was not gonna, you know, ever feel that feeling again. And a year later, I managed to win the same tournament. So I went from being, you know, one of the worst, you know, in that tournament to, to being the best. So Great. I think that was, a, that was a stepping stone for me in my career at, an, at such an early age, though. But I got this belief in myself that I could, if I would work hard, I could do this, definitely. Nice. Yeah. And you did indeed. You became a grand master. Um, mm -hmm. I think uh, I, I, I didn't write it down. I, I think it was 2013. Yeah. Yeah. OK. Yeah, um, and are there any moments or games in your career that you remember particularly well? Um, yeah, there are definitely some moments, but <laughs> I think most of them are actually bad memories because I, ha I ha actually I have the personality that you know I use these moments to motivate myself. So I I had three or four chances to become a GM before I became one in, in 2013, uh, which I I mean I lost against great players, but also weaker players, uh, and I used that to spur me on. So, but as a memorable moment, I would definitely mention uh, my game against Alexis Shirov in 2011. Uh, I was playing in the European Individual Team Championship and two days before the tournament my computer broke down oh. and I went to the tournament without one uh, so I barely analyzed during the whole tournament. I, I was relying on my coach to show me something before the game but he was you know busy you know helping everybody and I actually managed to beat Alexis Shiro, which is one of my favorite players, and went on to score a GM norm. And that also just showed me that, okay, preparation is important. I always prepare myself, but also just to be, you know, after that game, I just felt like I could beat everybody, you know, beating such a strong player. I mean, it just gave me confidence. So, you, I mean, you can, you have these moments in my career that I needed a confidence boost and I got it and then I went on to, to you know, play you know, great chess. So I would definitely say that that was one of my favorite moments for sure. Nice. Yeah, I can imagine. The best stories seem to be those where you either the computer is breaking down or nothing is working or something is <laughs> falling apart and then you still win this definitely. super important or difficult game. I, I remember a similar story uh, by Nicholas Pert. Um, so now you have reached Uh, over 2,600. You are the grandmaster. Um, so you've accomplished a lot. How do you get any ambition to climb higher in rating? And do you even have an ambition? Because you also mentioned there's always a little plan B uh, on mm -hmm. the side. And maybe you say like, okay, that's it. I'm grandmaster, 2,600. That's all I wanted to have. It's time to settle. Um, to be honest, I, I started this year in January where I just, you know, sat down and, and I thought about my goals. And, you know, my goals were actually to reach the World Cup, to reach 2600 and become Icelandic champion. <laughs> and, then, and then all of it, all of it happened in the period of three months. And, and this might sound weird, but it came as a shock to me. And, and I thought okay, wow, what am I going to do now? So I, I basically had the same realization that you're asking that, what am I going to do now? And I have to decide because I don't think you can ever become, you know, 26, 30, 40, 50, unless you really, you know, immerse yourself in the game of chess and just, you know, only focus on that. But I, I have to admit that I'm deciding, you know, I'm, I guess I'm just deciding whether I'm willing to do that because I also yeah. have other ambitions, like you said, And mostly, you know, connected to teaching, because I think that I have a lot more to give in that area. And also, I would like to give something back to the Icelandic, you know, chess scene, which has, you know, given me so many good memories and, and supported me through all this. So I, I feel like I might be at the moment of, you know, giving back instead of focusing on my, on my own goals, to be honest. Sure, absolutely. It's, uh, I'm, I'm very happy that you're honest uh, with, <laughs> with me and with us. Um, that's a great segue, by the way. So uh, the current chess scene in Iceland, 
how can I imagine uh, it and how does it look like? So, like, how do people train? How do people compete with each other? Of course, there are some tournaments, um, mm. but there's there are there are a lot of strong juniors in Iceland. So, how vibrant is the chess scene there? Um, I think it has changed over the last two or three decades. From uh, I would say from being a, about you know quality and more surrounding itself around quantity. Hmm. I mean, I think that I've just felt like a strong chess wave recently. Not you know, and also just before coronavirus. I think yeah. that I mean, when I entered the university in 2013 or 14, I got message met messages every day. People saying that you know I play on chess.com or lead chess and and I'm, I'm I mean how can I improve I mean you are you are a grandmaster can you help me and, and just <laughs> random, random people that I would never have thought play chess so uh, I think we are going through a tough time when it comes to bring you know comes to strong players I mean we have we have one youngster now that is Vignir Vatnar Stefansson uh, he's He's an IM. He will definitely become a GM in the next probably two or three years. Mm -hmm. But besides him, I'm not sure which. Uh, I mean, which player will be the next GM? But okay. I think that you know the focus has been on quantity definitely, and and I don't think there is anything wrong with that. We don't need to be the strongest uh, in chess, but I, I mean, I just want people to enjoy chess. Chess is also a game. I think we tend to forget that. I mean, not everybody has to become a, a professional. So, yeah, I would definitely say that the chess scene is vibrant, but mm -hmm. more focused on on broadcasting the game than than you know making sure that we have you know a GM every year. Yeah, I understand. And uh, since fun or enjoying chess is a big point in your life, especially in the last couple of months or years, mm -hmm. uh, I understand how you feel for that. Um, so. During the lockdown, did you play much chess online? And uh, how how often did you even uh, use chess space? Maybe for trainings, I assume, mm -hmm. or, or teachings? Well, I've never been a big fan of online chess. Like oh. when I was younger, I didn't play that much online chess. I The reason for that is that I think I just fell in love with the psychological factors of chess. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I love sitting at the board you know, seeing the stress in my opponent that I'm also feeling and, you know, seeing him sweating and going to the toilet 10 times a game. And, and I, I just, I'm a big fan of the psychological factors. I, I truly am. And you don't really feel that during, during online chess. I mean, when you have time trouble, I mean, you don't, you don't feel anything besides just making the next move. So I, I mean, there were a lot of online tournaments in Iceland during the coronavirus, yeah. uh, you know, lockdown. So, but I think that after Five six months, everybody you know fell a little bit disinterested in online chess. I think like everywhere else in the world. But chess space, I mean, you should probably ask me what I don't use my chess space for. <laughs> I, I sometimes feel like I use my chess space for everything. I mean, it's it's just you know storing my analysis, going over openings, going over games. But I'm also a big fan of you know the Fritz program. I use it a lot to okay. practice my opening. A lot of players like to go online and practice their opening because it feels kind of you know more real when you face an actual opponent. But I think the Fritz program is becoming that good that it's playing various moves and it's not always picking you know the main line. Mm -hmm. So it seems like I have some weird, I get some weird pleasure of you know getting you know Fritz crushing me ten times in some opening <laughs> just to you know <laughs> learn about the structure. So I think that I mean I use them. Almost as much, I would think. Nice. Uh, as long as you think, you have uh, also played uh, plenty uh, of Olympiads. Um, mm. Which one was your favorite? Oh, my favorite. Uh, well, the first one is always special. Mm -hmm. they say. So uh, that was in Siberia. Um, which, I mean, it's not the most interesting place in the world. And it felt kind of surreal to play a tournament like that. But I would definitely say that my favorite is the, the Tromsø in, in Norway. Okay. I think that it just kind of felt like playing at home. I mean, you had, True. you know, you had sunlight 24 hours and 
and you had mountains everywhere so it, yeah it just it kind of felt like home so i think and i also scored my i think it was my best performance at an olympia i think nice so yeah i would definitely say the, the norway edition definitely um something a bit different what are your hobbies and passions besides chess and what else can you really do in Iceland that much <laughs> okay fair question fair question I mean we can't really be outside for like four or five months of the year <laughs> I mean we definitely can't but nobody wants to <laughs> I've always been a big football fanatic and okay. just you know the Master United Cup is always you know close oh, by oh so yeah. your, can I quickly interfere who's your favorite player and what do you say to Cristiano Ronaldo now Uh, well, my favorite player is obviously Paul Scholes. I mean, being, uh, <laughs> being uh, having a red hair and all that. But uh, I'm I'm having a love hate relationship now with Manchester United for for over 24 years. So it's uh, it's kind of hard. But I mean, the golden boy has returned, but it feels like he's he's two or three years too old. But I mean, oh, harsh. Words. I mean, he, yeah, yeah. But this is going to be a tough season. But it's like. I always compare my love for Manchester United for the love of, you know, the parent has for a child. I mean, you love you love your football team, you know, through everything. So no matter what it does. So I think that I mean I will keep supporting them even if they, they keep on playing like they are doing these days. Mm, I got you. Um you mentioned Paul Scholes as a ginger. Mm -hmm. You yourself uh, have red hair, and I have recently watched a clip uh, of the ginger GM Simon Williams, and uh, out of nowhere he, he mentioned an anecdote about you, and he actually called you the ginger Karpov. That's your nickname. Was this his idea? Is this a real nickname? What What's this all about? And what was the story which you had, uh, which happened in the bar with Simon Williams? He he mentioned his own version. What's your version? <laughs> yeah, you should definitely not be believe his version. I can make a promise you that. Well, first of all, I just hope that Anatoly is not watching because it, it kind of feels like insulting him. But this is an actual nickname that... Yeah, just to mention, I did not give myself because I'm not comparing myself to him. Um, I was playing for a team that uh, that Simon was also playing for, uh, mm -hmm. Dukes of Kent, and uh, some great guys that I played for. Um, and the first weekend that I played for them, I think it was four rounds, I scored four out of four. I had an amazing performance and, and all of the games were quite smooth, to be honest. And mm -hmm. I think, I mean, you know, you know how Simon Williams plays. I mean, he <laughs> plays the exact opposite. So I think it felt like kind of baffling for him to watch that you were able to win games by playing in a more elegant style, a more, you know, more grown up style, I might mention if he's watching. But uh, yeah, so he gave me this nickname. But he also, uh, I mean, we have been friends for a long time. And he yeah. actually played, a, he played a, a big part in me becoming a grammar master, actually because we were playing together in the European Club Cup. I was playing for, for his team and it was the last round and I needed to face a GM and needed to win. And we played a, a rather rather weak team from Ireland, I think, which had one GM that had, I think, close to 2,400. And he sacrificed himself on the first board because I was on the second board and, and he allowed me to play and I managed to win and get my final GM norm. Wow. And But uh, answering your question about the bar, I think he's, I mean, I, I should probably not say this, but <laughs> there, are quite a, there are quite a few stories uh, connected to a bar and, and, and us too. But I think the stories that he's referring to <laughs> is the time that uh, I was playing in the, U, in the British League with a friend of mine and colleague, Ray Thorfersson, another Icelandic GM. And we had one more night after, you know, the tournament. We were going back home on a Monday. So we decided to stay the night in uh, his hometown, which is called God Damning. And I'm, <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not kidding you. It's, it's called God Damning, uh, which, is, which is kind of scary in itself. That, my uh, yeah, it's horrible. And uh, so we just, uh, we came to, to his hometown and we entered, you know, we checked into the hotel 
which was probably like 200 years old. They were, everything was quite scary. And afterwards, we went to his home, and he had a bar just right next to his apartment. It was unbelievable. It was like he was running the place. And he asked us, like, how was your hotel? And we, we obviously oh, just, yeah, it's okay. It's a little bit scary. And, and he asked, like, okay, which room did you get? And we were like, yeah, room 13. Oh, okay. There was a murder there 200 years ago. <laughs> no. And, and uh, I mean, there was this woman who was... I think murder who was haunting the place. Oh and, well, I mean, God. of course, you know, he's messing with you, but I remember looking at my friend and saying, <laughs> okay, we're probably not going to sleep that much. So let's just have a few drinks and see how it goes. <laughs> and that was the time that Simon uh, uh, just, yeah, he in, invited us for a few Jaeger bombs. And for those of you who've had a Jaeger bomb, it's not, it's not really healthy. And so I don't remember that much from that night besides him carrying me and to my room and saying just, you know, God bless you and, and, and I hope you survive the night. So that's <laughs> probably the probably the story that he's referring to. Oh my God. Uh, <laughs> so we've had a few, you know, quite wild nights, but I mean there's never a dull moment. Yeah, what a time. great friendship. I can I can just <laughs> imagine. No, I I can I can imagine. That's that's uh always a lot of fun with with that chap ah nice one um yeah thanks for for sharing this uh, uh, bit private story it's it's nice mm -hmm. to hear a, a bit of a personal touch like this too uh mm -hmm. back to chess <laughs> yeah um can you tell me what was the thing that improved your chess the most if there is such a thing um I would say being able to face adversity. I guess. Um, Interesting. You know, yeah. When I was when I was younger, I, I had some problems. You know, when I was uh, some temperament problems. When I was losing games, and and I had some issues with you know how to handle you know difficult defeats. Mm -hmm. uh, but when you mature, I mean, it gets easier by time. But I think that you know facing adversity and and is just a part of life. I mean, you face adversity at, at, at every area of it, not just at the chessboard. So I think that, you know, getting back up when you are knocked down, I think it has helped me quite a lot because you're always going to get knocked down at some point. That's just true. That's part of becoming a good chess player. So I, I would def, I would say that was the main factor, I think. Hmm. But also, also just, you know, like I mentioned earlier, you know, the support I've gotten over the years from my family because... I witnessed so many youngsters from Iceland that didn't have the same, you know, support from their family. And it just becomes so hard because you, mm -hmm. you definitely need someone when you have a difficult day at the office. Yeah, I mean, that's just vital. So these two things for sure. Nice, nice answer. Um, do you have any idols or role models uh, that impressed you a lot? Um. I could mention a couple, but the first person that comes to mind is definitely my mentor, uh, Helge Olofsson, uh, who is a strong player. Uh, I think he is the main reason that I, you know, chess-wise became a, a grandmaster. He was supporting me throughout the years. Uh, but what I admire the most about him is that he's also just a, you know, just an incredible human being, because I think it's really hard to become that good at something and not lose, you know, some of your personality in the progress, like, you know, not becoming arrogant or too competitive or, you know, or too much of an introvert or just, I mean, all of these things that can happen to you. And then mm -hmm. I just really admire him for that. But, but of course, also uh, one player that comes to mind is obviously Magnus Carlsen. But mm. I would definitely, it's for the same reason, because he's a, he's a, He's an amazing guy as well, amazing personality, but also what he has done for chess. I mean, I I think we sometimes forget uh, where chess would be if it hadn't been for Magnus Carlsen. Mm -hmm. I mean, I mean, you had Gary Kasparov being, you know, the the all time great, and and he was a you know a handsome and intellectual and all that. But uh, we needed somebody from you know Western Europe to take the throne. I think it was really important, more important than we can imagine. Yeah. So definitely these two come to mind for sure. Nice. Yeah. 
Um, do you have any favorite chess book? Mm, well, I I think I have every chess book written uh, in my in my library. I'm uh, I like to read whether it's about chess or, or something else. But uh, there are two books that come to mind: uh, "Perfect Your Chess" by Andrei Volokhin and and uh, Grabinski. Uh, it was just like a puzzle book, but it was just really tough. It was <laughs> incredibly tough when I when I went through it, and I always like a challenge, so that really sticks with me. And I I go I go over it oh, probably once a year. Oh. Uh, also, uh, a friend of mine wrote a book called Applying Logic in Chess, Eric Kislik, and I mean we talked a lot through uh, the the process of writing and. And it was amazing, you know, we sometimes forget that chess is a very logical game. You know, when we make a good move, it's usually easily understandable. You know, you, you can make uh, an argument why it's a good move mm -hmm. by applying logic. And I thought that was really interesting. It, it, was a, it was a fairly easily understandable subject, but it has never really been written about. So I, I thought that was really interesting as well. Excellent. Uh, any chess favorite chess movie or chess series? Well, <laughs> Queen's Gambit obviously is a yeah, it's, is a favorite for everybody now. Yes, it is. It is. I and I kind of like. I mean, you can easily compare uh, the story with you know the one of Bobby Fischer. I mean, you have the Cold War and and also the, the nice touch that you have a female chess player, which I I mean, it wouldn't have been the same if you'd had a had a an arrogant, uh, you know, guy playing the star sure. role. So I really like that touch. And I think the chess community has to do better when it comes to female chess, definitely, because there, there's no reason why women can't play or be competitive uh, in chess. So mm -hmm. that is one of my, you know, one of the things that I'm trying to do in Iceland to, to you know, get girls more involved. But it seems to be a more social, social sport for them. Which is which makes it hard, but yeah, definitely Queen's Gambit. I think it was a it was an amazing series. Mm. Yeah. yeah, excellent. Um, I think I have uh, asked all my questions. That was genuinely <laughs> awesome uh, and very very interesting. Uh, thank you so much. But we're not at the very end because uh, you're kind of kind enough to share one tiny bit of one of your favorite games explain yeah mm -hmm. you can share the screen and explain a little yeah, bit sure. about this uh, and show us the example i'm very curious because i don't know what it is yet okay so this was a game played in the Reykjavik open uh, in 2010 uh, i had been make i I had been making some strides forward uh, in my chess career at that point and mm -hmm. i had the rating of 2360 but it was mostly I was mostly beating you know lower rated players because in local tournaments in Iceland we don't have that many you know IMs that are playing so uh, uh, you know beating this strong grandmaster and a friend of mine uh, Arthur Kogan uh, was a was a big win for me personally and he, he has the the last name of the evil guy from Highlander so he must be a strong oh, person. okay okay well. <laughs> I, uh, I well, think it's cool god but i'm, I'm not 100 percent <laughs> sure but uh, he's a he's a great guy and, mm -hmm. and one that always has a smile on his face and he actually he made a smile towards the end when he when he resigned and it just comes to show how what a great guy he is but nice. i'm just going to show you the opening real quick sure um, so you have done your homework i i'm playing you know a, a <laughs> that that <laughs> that uh, you know move towards Nimso Indian. And I remember this is fairly, you know, 96 is obviously main night here, but I, I had analyzed this before the game. And I remember at this point, this was probably the, the critical moment for me uh, for what I'm going to show you later on. Okay. Because I have some problems here. I mean, white definitely has space advantage. So I, I mean, I have to attack the center of the board somehow. I mean, this attack usually doesn't evolve that quickly, so I'm, I'm not that afraid right now. But if I'm not careful, he's just going to push with maybe even g4, g5 at some point. Mm -hmm. And and even, I mean, he can even bring this bishop to h4 in some positions. Uh, so I have to act quickly. 
And then I came up with this idea that, okay, I could attack the, the D4 pawn. And okay, I expected this. And then this F5 move. Mm. And here I have to make a decision what I'm going to do. Uh, I think knight, I haven't checked this with a computer. And the only reason why I haven't checked it is because I think it will ruin my memory of it. <laughs> because I, I, That's I interesting. Think the, I think the computer will definitely say like, yeah, your, your brilliance wasn't that brilliant. Uh, so I'm not going to check it ever. And if somebody uh... tries to... Uh, if somebody tries to tell me otherwise, I'm not going to listen to that individual. Excellent. Okay, so don't even <laughs> worry. P leave your engines out now. Just yeah, exactly. enjoy the so, moment. <laughs> so no no emails after this show. I mean, if you're watching this, if you send me an email, I'm not going to reply. <laughs> so I played this move 95, which looks really odd because, True. I mean, he has the simple move of playing queen g3. And, okay, first of all, it makes sense maybe to go 94. But then I'm probably having problems with this bishop on on a5 because he's not hitting anything if he if he takes twice. So uh, I thought that at this point that I might do something a little bit different. And if somebody was to try and find the best move here, which is definitely the best move, no matter what the computer says, <laughs> uh, they should definitely try because it's an interesting idea, I think. So Okay, first... so pause the video yes. for a second yeah, if you don't want to spoil it. Think about what would be the most natural, lovely, or interesting, or good move. And don't look at the engine. Don't think about an engine move. Think about something intuitive and amazing. Okay, and we're back. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Thank you. Uh, so I decided to take you. Okay, okay, let's say he takes back. Then I get the e4 square. And worst, I mean, worst case scenario, this bishop is on c1 is quite inactive. And I have, you know, the usual position, you know, uh, benefits of, you know, all these pawn islands and so on. So I thought that, okay, if he's not going to take, he's going to take on g5, which seems to be quite forced. And True. here, I mean, the most logical move seems to be just, you know, bishop a5 and then go back to c7 and just play the position because yeah. he has the same problem with a bishop on c1. And I mean, I probably think that bishop a5 is the best move here, but... Uh, this move, rook takes e5. Lovely. I is saw, what I, I played. I saw it. I thought about it for a second. <laughs> that is yeah. awesome. I love these things. And I mean, it seems so unnatural to sacrifice an exchange when you leave your opponent with two bishops. I mean, usually you sacrifice an exchange and your opponent has maybe two knights. So, I mean, you have some compensation besides, you know, one pawn. Yeah. Uh, but in this particular position, I thought that. My bishop on e5 was going to be a monster. And if he would take on c3, I could just go back and then I can, you know, pressure the pawn on e3 and even play c4 and just try to close the position. And I have, you know, really good play, I think. And white's attack is obviously over. Uh, but I, I remember that he looked at me and, and in disbelief, <laughs> probably because, probably because, I mean, this, this is not a really... I think uh, a normal idea to sacrifice this rook on e5 for such a somewhat wake compensation. Certainly. But so yeah, but so he took quite quite quickly. Whoa. But then it, I think he just realized how bad it was, you know, after four or five, six moves, because you can see how it develops. I mean, he has to play rook b1 to try to yeah. get his bishop out. And it seems to just flow really naturally. So I'm just going to go through it real quickly. Queen d6. And just to push... Uh, push b5 eventually. Uh, and you can just see all these weaknesses. I mean, he's trying to, probably trying to attack because when you have two bishops, you're, you're told that you have to attack <laughs> or you have to open up the position. But it seems like he's just in vain. I mean, this just seems to flow really comfortably here for for black. And I'm just going to show you the end because it was, uh, you can see that the rook oh. on h3 has, has seen better days. <laughs> uh, I could probably play this more convincingly, but at the time I remember that I was really relaxed in this position. I, I thought that, I mean, it's not possible to play this position as white, so I could more or less do whatever I wanted to. Uh -huh. uh, and the uh, point being that his rook can't really go back because it takes such a long time. And it actually ended up being uh, about his rook on g3. Because as you can see, uh, his rook isn't going in oh anywhere my. in this position. So I could just <laughs> so I could just push on, uh, and actually just 
one last thing is that when he resigned in this position, uh, he actually moved his rook to f5. <laughs> he just he, he actually he just took the rook and took an f5. And, and I just remember, I mean, the, the expression on my face. I was just terrified. I was just like, what? I, for like a, a second, I was just like, did I really miss rook f5? And then he just then he just left and and resigned. But it was it just <laughs> it just shows you, you know the. And this is what I was telling you about earlier, like the psychological factor. I was so nervous because I, I couldn't believe that I was beating this guy with black pieces and and in a such a in a such a manner. I mean, this was not pure luck. This was I think it was a really good game overall. So uh, him taking on F5 with his rook, uh, yeah, it was it was a shock. Awesome. But yeah. But I was I was really proud of this this game. And it, I think it was another stepping stone in my career. It gave me belief that I could, you know, compete on this level. Uh-huh. For sure. Excellent. So, yeah. Thank you so much for sharing. Yeah, my pleasure. You can pleasure. unshare the screen uh, one mm-hmm. last time. Um, yeah, that was it. That was the best in Iceland with Hjörva Gretason. Um, thank you so, so much for this interview. I hope all of you enjoyed it at home and we see each other for the next best in interview soon. Bye bye. Thank you.